Eye of the Beholder is a much-loved RPG from the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons franchise. Developed by Westwood and published by SSI in 1991, the game was initially released for DOS PCs and supported CGA, EGA, and VGA graphics in addition to AdLib and Sound Blaster cards. The game was later ported to the Amiga, NEC's PC-98, Sega CD, and Super Nintendo. Like Dungeon Master and a multitude of other tunnel crawlers that came before it, Eyes Mazes are presented in a 3D first-person perspective. Turning is limited to the four major compass directions, and each scene is comprised of pre-rendered tiles. The game isn't a straight-up hack-and-slash affair, focusing also on puzzle solving. Setting up your party, choosing the right classes, items, and spells is important if you want to survive the many hazards that await. Some quests require you to traverse back to previous levels once new items are acquired in order to solve them, and level progression isn't always linear. An early preview of this brand new Commodore 64 port was released all the way back in 2006. Now, after 16 years, the game is finally getting a full release on our beloved 8-bit system. Is there any way it'll be even half faithful to the original? There's only one way to find out, so let's take a look, shall we? The first thing to know is that the game will only be available as a cartridge image. You'll need an Easy Flash, Ultimate, Turbo Chameleon, Kung Fu Flash, Backbit, or other compatible device. Disk drives are supported for save files, but the game data itself is just too large. I'll be using the C128 in 64 mode today for reasons that will become clear shortly. A 1351 mouse or compatible device is recommended, but the game can be played just fine using only the keyboard. There aren't enough titles out there that make use of the mouse, so I'm really glad to see this. Starting with the intro sequence, which has been reproduced in its entirety, we can already start to see the care and detail that has gone into this port. I'll be showing the game exclusively on a CRT, instead of screen caps or a modern flat panel, because it looks simply stunning in the warm glow of a period correct display. The softer edges and dithering just look right to me. It's harder to film it this way, but I hope you can tell just how good the game looks. The 64 port was developed by Andreas Larsen, aka Jack Asser of Booze Design. Help with the graphics, music, and sound effects came courtesy of an entire cast of big names from various demo scene groups. You may recognize Vito from his work on the amazing Sonic the Hedgehog port that we reviewed a year ago. Here in the main menu, we can start a new game, load an existing save, and configure our input device. A nice touch is that we're given the option to choose between the cartridge's flash memory, which is fast and makes a great option for quick saving, and an attached disk drive, which is slower but gives you multiple slots to work with. Starting a new game takes us to the character creation screen. Here, we can assemble our starting party of four from a variety of races and classes taken from 2nd edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons rules. Later in the game, the party can be expanded up to six characters, as NPCs join our ranks or we resurrect other fallen adventurers along the way. There are plenty of portraits available to customize each of your characters. I tried making my party all identical twins, but the game wouldn't let me. Foiled again. The game interface itself is faithful to the original. The dungeon is beautifully presented in this viewport. You interact with your party here, attacking, accessing your inventory, swapping who's in front, and checking your vitals. In the camp menu, you can rest and set up your wizard and cleric spells. You'll need to do this before entering combat, or whenever you learn new, more powerful spells. You can also save and load your game here. 
the interface is highly intuitive and feels like using a much more powerful machine from the 16-bit era. Accessing your inventory is also a point-and-click affair. Right-clicking on the note does exactly what you'd expect, and you can start to learn about the backstory and your mission. I'm already starting to forget that I'm playing this on a machine with only 64k of RAM. Alright, let's check out some gameplay. Interacting with the world feels totally natural, an impressive feat given the age of the hardware. The graphics were painstakingly converted by hand, pixel by pixel, and they look, well, I don't need to tell you, do I? Even the small details, like creatures lurking in the sewers, have been included. Movement is also instinctual, using the familiar WASD keys from later FPS games. In the original PC version, the numeric keypad was used instead. I want to cast Magic Missile! Where are the Cheetos? A convenient in-game help screen is available by hitting H. Here, we can see all of the movement and action hotkeys. Character inventories can be quickly accessed with corresponding number keys instead of using the mouse, which is a nice accelerator. The keys are arranged in such a way that the most common actions can be performed without having to move your hand, just like modern games of today. WASD to move, Q and E to turn, number keys to access inventories and stats, and the back arrow to escape out of any of the context menus. The game can be played without a mouse, but I recommend using one for the most authentic experience. Left click is used to pick up items and interacts with the game world. Right click to use items, attack, or cast spells. One last thing to note is the auto map that shows where you've been and any unique features in a room. This is something the original versions didn't even have, requiring the time-honored tradition of manually drawing the map on paper. Having this feature is a huge luxury, making the Commodore 64 version even better than the original. You knew this was coming, right? Why I'm playing on a C128? The answer is because it has two separate video chips, the VIC-2 and the VDC for 80 column RGB. The latter can still be used while in 64 mode, and Eye of the Beholder has now joined the ranks of a very small number of dual monitor games for the system. How cool is that? The second display is dedicated to a separate high-res auto map. With the map on its own screen, you can always see where you are and where you're going in an instant without switching away from your 3D viewport. This is a fantastic addition to the game and the best way to play as you can move through the world in real time and never be lost. Case in point, if you face north, you can use WASD to bomb through the map at incredible speeds when you need to backtrack to somewhere you've already been. This simply wouldn't be possible without the second display, unless you've already memorized the dungeon, I guess. Of note is that the game can also make use of the 128's 2 MHz CPU. Currently, there's a known bug when using the 1541 Ultimate 2 Plus cart, but a fix is in the works. Now let's take a look at some A-B comparisons of the source artwork and the C64 version from the developer's own channel. Both the graphics and sound in the C64 port are based on the Amiga ECS version of the game. The artwork was initially converted to the 64's limited palette and resolution using scripts. Afterwards, each element was retouched by hand, a process that took around 18 months to complete. As if that weren't enough, custom sprite work was needed to handle color clash and get around the limitations of the system's multicolor bitmap mode. The entire 3D viewport is covered in a full sprite layer as a result. To make all this possible, Andreas created his own custom tooling using a modern development environment. Truly a Herculean level of effort has gone into bringing this port to life. 
I certainly have gained a greater appreciation for the game having learned these details, and I hope you will as well. It's worth noting that the full game experience is accounted for in its entirety here. Nothing has been left out, and there are even some extras that we'll take a look at shortly. Alright, what other tasty treats does this port have in store for us? First, transparency effects allow you to see that there are enemies lurking on the other side of certain grates and doors. Pay close attention to deviations in the walls. There might be hidden buttons or secrets to unlock. Some walls are illusory and allow you to pass right through. A compendium of all the foes you'll encounter as you traverse deeper and deeper into the dungeon is presented in this bestiary, another bonus feature unique to the C64 version of the game. The inventory management screen allows you to kit out your weapons, armor, utility, and the like. Oh, yeah, like you don't pick up every single item you find lying on the ground in these games. Sure. New spells become available as you discover scrolls and level up your characters. Over 45 spells in total are included in the game. Each level has its own special quest to complete. Good luck figuring out what they are though without a walkthrough, as the game sure isn't going to tell you. I mentioned earlier how the game isn't strictly combat focused. This teleporter puzzle is representative of the types of challenges you'll face in the dungeons beneath Waterdeep. Plenty of traps await you as well, but some can be avoided if you're fast enough. Thieves can sometimes disarm traps while picking a lock. For others, you'll just have to learn from experience. Ow, jeez! As you explore the dungeon, you'll encounter other NPCs that will offer to join your party. You can also resurrect the bones of dead adventurers you pick up along the way to buff up your ranks. I'm sure reanimating corpses isn't morally ambiguous, as long as it's a cleric doing it, right? Right? Other NPCs will give you quests, provide healing, advance the storyline, you know, the usual stuff. Portals look cool, so I'm showing one. Don't need any other reason than that. The game runs on both PAL and NTSC hardware. Earlier, I mentioned that it can take advantage of the faster CPU on the C128, clocking it up when the VIX raster line is in the upper and lower borders of the screen. Here's why that's useful. On a stock 64, you'll sometimes experience slowdown when many enemies are attacking at once. When this happens, the controls become a bit sluggish to respond. Here's the game running great on the Mr. FPGA C64 core. Easy flash carts are supported, but saving is not yet implemented, so you'll have to use a disc for the time being. The slowdown we saw earlier is present here as well. However, if we go into the cores menu and enable the C128 turbo option, we can then hit F3 in the game to switch 2 MHz mode on. Instantly, the lag disappears. The UI not only becomes more responsive, but you can hear it in the increased cadence of the enemy attacks. A 
Another great way to play Eye of the Beholder is with emulation. The 128's faster CPU and dual displays are fully supported in Vice, as you'd expect. The game also runs on the C64 hardware with firmware 1.6.1 or higher. Having loved the game in his youth, Eye of the Beholder started Andreas down the path of reverse engineering when he learned to hack his saved game files. Later in 2003, he started coding on the C64 more seriously and began work on a port, but wasn't able to see it through due to memory constraints and the lack of fully reversed game code. After painstakingly disassembling and creating a pixel-perfect Java port and an iPhone version that was never released due to licensing issues with the App Store, the C64 project was reborn. Even with the comparatively massive storage of the Easy Flash, bringing the game to life on an 8-bit system wasn't a cakewalk. It was still a huge challenge working within the constraints of available RAM and ROM. Remember, the PC version occupied two 1.4 megabyte high-density disks and required 640K of memory. The introduction alone is basically a tech demo in and of itself. Each scene required different techniques to bring to life, mixing multiple layers of bitmaps, character graphics, and sprites together to replicate the PC original. It can't be overstated how much effort went into bringing this port to life. Many people contributed to the project over the years, and the team had a great time working together with no set deadlines, just an ambitious goal. This achievement really raises the bar for the Commodore 64. It's definitely one of the most complex and in-depth games ever seen on an 8-bit system. Every room, trap, quest, monster, weapon, and spell is accounted for in the 12 levels of gameplay. Eye of the Beholder will be released for the Commodore 64 and 128 this month and will be free to download. A physical, boxed edition is planned to follow. For more detailed information on how the game was created, check out the developer's YouTube channel. A link is in the description. I hope you enjoyed this bit. Thank you so much for watching, and see you next time on Retro Bits. Roll the dice to see if I'm getting drunk! <laughs>